Welcome back to another episode of The Feed. Today, I have a special guest with me. Well, you got to see him in a second, Mr. Jake Ehrlichman. So, Jake, say hello to the people. Mick? Hello, Ottawa people. How's everybody doing today? They said they're, they're good. <laughs> so I'm glad to have you um, give people a quick rundown of your history in automotive. You can talk about our history, but don't don't get too don't get too specific. <laughs> don't worry. Yeah, I'm, I've known Charles for God. I'd say about eight nine years now. Um, so history for me, I've been in the business for 25 years. I started in 2000 actually cleaning cars at a Subaru shop and key a lot uh, in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Uh, from there, I've done just about every job within a dealership, um, from sales to sales manager to sales director, um, and also spent about five years working for Auto Alert as a trainer and then as a training manager and director. Um, my entire career was really built and grown off understanding the value of using the Auto Alert platform, how to proactively create your own opportunities so you don't have to sit by the door or sit by the computer and wait for people to come into you. You have the opportunity every day to make smart outreach to clients to try to fill your own book, fill your own cup so you're not subject to, well, is the market slow or is the market fast or things good or not? So um, not only did I turn my career into something very different by utilizing Auto Alert, but it allowed me to teach it. And that's something I'm very passionate about is getting other people to understand the value and kind of taking control of their own destiny, right? How do I really take my time at the dealership and make it useful so I can go home at the end of the day and you know, look my family in the face and say, yeah, I worked 60 hours this week or 50 hours this week. But every minute that I was working, I was trying to help a customer and trying to sell a car. And not a lot of people have the, the, the right amount of opportunities to do that on a consistent basis just based on leads coming in. I, I hear that. And speaking of using your time wisely, look, it's football season and it's the fourth quarter. So we're going to do that play on words. But Let's let's put our heads in the minds of a fourth quarter car dealer. Uh, the first thing I wanted to bring up is vehicle affordability and new car pricing and any any specials. How do we wrap our heads around what's going on in the market today and then get through the rest of this year and set ourselves up for the next year? So this is a, a big topic around the industry right now, really big topic at Walzer Automotive Group because of the different brands that we carry. Now, there are differences between brands right now that are actually a wider gap than we've seen historically. I've got certain brands that we're still focusing on selling down to zero, right? It's literally selling through all of our inventory every single month because earning more inventory in those stores is incredibly important. Now, a lot of people would think, hey, if you're trying to sell down to zero, you're going to sell every vehicle at sticker price. That's not necessarily the case because each model has a different supply and demand as well, even within those brands. So this is where being very strategic and very creative, how you do your pricing and your advertising becomes critical. If I want to sell through every Tacoma, that's a lot harder than selling through every RAV4 right now. It's not impossible. And that's where we get very, very specific with private offers, with flash sales, with things that we can do on an individual marketing level to make sure we hit our turn rates and our travel rates for each model and ultimately make sure that we're out turning our district, our region, and our nation. So it's not about flatline pricing or cutting all the gross out of every model that might not have the momentum to sell on its own. It's about understanding which trims and which models are not moving at the pace that you need them to and getting very strategic and creative on how am I going to get the message out to the right potential buyers. Some of this is through working our database. Some of this is through working our database of leads, right? Database of owners and database of leads are very different. So in a brand like Toyota or Subaru or Honda, where we're still holding gross at a very high level, we still want to make sure we're strategically and wisely pricing all those new cars to generate the leads that we need and the sales that we need, but not necessarily going, well, these are in demand right now, so everyone's going to be sticker or over sticker price. Now, on the other side, we've got brands that are struggling a little bit more to move some of these vehicles. So we've got Stellantis and Nissan, for instance. We've got a 90 or 120 day supply of vehicles kind of across the nation in those brands. So the, the, the days in COVID where we could say, hey, everything is worth a lot of money. Everything deserves to grow. It's not really the way we have to look at certain brands right now. We need to make money. But if I'm trying to make two, three, four thousand dollars in profit on vehicles that don't have the demand right now, what I'm going to do is start stacking up floor plan. 
and I'm going to start spending a fortune just to keep these cars in stock. So really getting deep into your travel rates, getting deep into your turn times and go, hey, if I've got an you know, an eight, eight month supply of gladiators right now, guess what? I've got to get very aggressive, very strategic to move those cars. I've got to understand my manufacturer programs better than the manufacturer rep even understands them. And that takes a lot of work. And I've got to really get in the weeds to say, how can I match buyers to these cars and get them to take the, the opportunities that I have? And if you're not really, really focusing on your turn times, your travel times, it's going to be really hard for you to know what you should and shouldn't accept in your allocations, right? Three or four years ago, two years ago, even there was no turndowns. Everybody was accepting everything. And we kind of overdid it. Like as an industry, we kind of overdid it. We kind of too many cars, right? (laughs) And and now we're sitting going, how well now we're just back to the way we used to sell cars, the way things were pre-COVID, pre-vehicle shortage. And this is where our marketing plays become very, very important. This is where things like the conversation around CDPs become very important. I want to know every communication that is going out to every customer through every source so I can follow their path and make sure that my outreach and my follow-up from existing leads, existing customers is timely. And all of that comes into, in many cases, getting your staff excited and bought in to your deals. So one of the things that we do is every month, at the beginning of the month, we put together a very, very strategic plan that is model by model. And we put together specials and price leaders, really trying to avoid avoid flatline pricing, right? Cars should be priced based on availability, age, desirability of the options and the colors and things of that nature. But when you get those specials out to your team and your team looks at you and goes, how in the heck did you do this? That's when you know you're going to have the momentum and the excitement for how they're handling those leads, how they're reaching out to customers. So just saying, hey, we're going to price everything at $500 over invoice or, hey, we're going to keep everything at sticker, try to negotiate prices from there. That's typically not going to get you the leads and the close rate that you need to move the inventory so that we can reduce some of these massive day supplies at the brands that need them. So really in conclusion on this topic, depending on what kind of store you are, what kind of group you are, understanding that my strategy at a Stellantis store is very, very different than my strategy at a Toyota store. But also at a Toyota store, understanding my strategy on a Crown or a Tacoma is very, very different than my strategy on a RAV4 or a Highlander. Those are the things that we're looking at every day to make sure that we keep the momentum going on every model. Again, with the goal, I want to outturn every one of my competitors, everyone in my region, everyone in my nation, in the nation, every single month on every model, if possible. Right. And it kind of, you touched on a few things there. You're not begging for more leads, Correct. your strategy is going in to kind of dictate how I'm handling these particular subsets of leads because the leads are going to come, but then you put that strategy in to game the types of leads you're going to get. And hundred percent well, floor plan, you, you, you have to. The, the leads are going to come. Now I can, I can say the leads are going to come from a Walzer perspective. We have a fantastic marketing department. Like they are dialed in. A lot of stores struggle to get their specials up. We've automated the whole process. We have our specials up on day one, right? On every single car. So that is all the organic stuff that helps us to generate the leads that we need. So we're averaging across all of our stores, we're averaging about 100 leads per salesperson per month. So our focus right now, and this is where the strategic pricing comes in, right? It's one thing to get a lead. It's another thing to have the right price point, the right narrative, the right response system set up so that customers go, wow, that really is a great deal, right? This is where I want to do business. Getting our clients at an early part in the stage to understand how we do business, right? Trying to differentiate what Walzer is compared to our competitors. We're working more right now instead of generating more leads is increasing the quality of them, right? Really looking deep at the sources, third-party leads. We can buy them up all day, but they're a challenge. My dealer friends out there know what I'm talking about. Uh, But how do I generate better organic leads, but then really working on closing percentage. Uh, Charles, one of the things I lead most of my trainings off with in my dealerships when I'm training with our, our salespeople is there's only two ways to sell more cars. A lot of people like to complicate it, but there's only two ways. You either increase your leads or you increase your closing percentage. And that's it. Right now, we feel like we are generating a sufficient amount of leads to hit all of our goals. We're not hitting all of our goals yet because our closing percentage isn't where it needs to be. That's where that new hire training comes into play. I want new hires coming in more ready to go. Ongoing training, but also the strategic pricing. 
the flash sales, right? The individual outreach that we're doing to harness our database through AutoAlert, to harness our database through our CRM, to drive people back in who now see, wow, I didn't know I could you know, sign and drive Visa Compass for $3.99 a month, right? People don't know these deals exist because all they are used to is, oh, there's a shortage, everything is too expensive. The affordability problem is real, but as a dealer with the right pricing, the right branding, you can get the message out to the right people that, hey, there are affordable options right now. There are ways to lower your payments. There's ways to lower your rates. And that's what we're really working on across the board to make sure that everybody in our um, PMAs knows where we are, what we've got, and that we've got the best in town. So now we're fixating on the the general area around because there's there's no better lead for organic situation than people who are in your backyard. Let's talk about acquisitions, right? (laughs) We're accessing what's available to you. One, you have the database that you do know, but you also have that surrounding area of people that you're servicing. What's your approach when it comes to acquisitions, especially with what's coming now and vehicle affordability and history recently of the used car market? What's the goal? So at, at Walzer, we are, I think we're probably more focused on acquisitions than just about any group I've ever worked with or seen. Um, and it's not... It's not what is the approach or what is the goal. This is a diversified approach. So auctions, as anybody knows, you look at your numbers from auctions. Yes, we're still going to auctions and we're still looking and we're still buying cars here and there, but the gross on your auction buys are almost non-existent. The reason we're buying at auction right now, for the most part, is so that we have cars available, specifically on-brand cars that can help attract clients. We want to get trades from those. We want to potentially have late model used cars so they maybe come in and either buy those at little or no gross or maybe switch them to new because we've got strategic pricing and incentives and deals. Um, but we are really active with KBB ICO. I will say though, that's starting to dry up a little bit compared to was it, what it was a couple of years ago when dealers were paying, you know, close to MSRP at MSRP or above MSRP for late model used cars. KBB ICO was wild. The leads were closing at a high percentage. Customers were honestly blown away with what they could get from their cars and it was really a big part of our acquisitions. It still is, but it's becoming more difficult. These leads are going to multiple stores. They're getting multiple bids. A lot of these KBB ICO leads are very familiar now that there's Carvana and CarMax out there who are paying honestly more than dealers probably are willing to for a lot of these cars, or at least are willing to give on their first pencil. So it's becoming a lot more challenging. So what we have done and continue to do is focusing our efforts on acquisitions for people who might not be that far down the funnel, right? <clears throat> people who don't know what their car is worth don't know what a good or a bad offer is until we can educate them. And it's an opportunity to be the first one. So ways we do that is every day we look at every one of our service schedules and we see who's coming in, who's in an equity position, who's got vehicles that we truly need. And I say that, Charles, very intentionally. The, the message of dealers want to buy cars has been so oversaturated over, honestly, the last 15 to 20 years that we haven't even realized for the most part, it doesn't mean anything to customers. Why does Say a customer- that again. Say that again. <laughs> the, the message that dealers want to buy cars has been so oversaturated throughout the industry that customer, it doesn't mean anything to them anymore. Because why do they care? Why do I care as a customer that you want cars for your inventory? It doesn't matter to me because it's not part of my life. But what makes them care is when you can back up the message by individual level with actual data and stats. And this is what we're working on. And and again, it's kind of one to one, but there's ways to do this in bulk. Auto Alert is a great way to help us do this. But if I tell you, Charles, hey, I'm looking to buy cars right now. Would you be willing to sell me yours? That's not going to mean much to you. But if I give you a message, whether it's in the service drive, on a phone call, through a text or an email, I say, hey, Charles, here's the deal. I know you're driving a 2022 RAV4 right now. That is the fastest selling used car in the Twin Cities. Every time we get one, it sells immediately. And because of that, I'm able to offer you more than the market should justify for that vehicle, allowing you to get into something new at a better price and payment than you normally would. That will click and resonate with you significantly more than, hey, we're buying cars right now, right? Yeah. It's got to be based in truth. You've got to be able to back it up. But when you do this, the connectivity level is very, very different, the engagement level. And what I'm trying to do is get a client who's not in that mode yet, who's not looking at their value, who's not thinking about selling or trading their car. And I actually want myself, my team, my store, I want to be the one that put them in the market. 
like a because when I'm the one, like that's exactly you're, right. You're putting them in the market. Exactly. You're making it their idea, and let me walk you through the process so you get to set the first expectation. Then you're hundred percent sold. And and sometimes they will shop beyond that. Some people will, but a vast majority of them, because you're already their dealer, right? You've already sold them a car or multiple cars and there's some level of trust, right? They said yes to us two years ago, five years ago, because they liked us enough to do business. Now I'm telling them, Hey, normally under normal market conditions, your car would be worth 20 grand, but because I don't have one on my lot and it's gotta be true, right? They're going to sniff it out. If it's, if you're, you know, Hey, I've, I've actually got 94 2022 RAV4s and I'm calling to tell you, I don't have any, like, that's not a good message. You're going to sever some relationships, right? <laughs> but if I tell you I don't have one and you look at my inventory and you go, he doesn't. I understand yeah. why. <laughs> yeah. now, now the connectivity is there. And hey, normally I would be offering 20 grand for this car. But because I don't have one, because I reached out to you, you didn't reach out to me. The only way I'm going to earn your business is I do something above and beyond the ordinary. So because of that, I'm going to offer you 20750 to buy that car or sell that car, whatever it may be. Like that's how you really make a connection with people and persuade and influence them to do something that they, they're going to do at some point in time, but I want to be the one and I want my store to be the ones that put them in the market. Yeah. And that kind of goes to your branding and this is what you can expect from this type of organization. Also, you already said yes once, you know, you already said yes. let me introduce, yep. allow me to reintroduce myself. So, and then the, the service, the service drive is a big part of that too. Um, service to sales. There's every dealership who's listening to this. They've, they've attempted, or they do some sort of service to sales process in their store. Normally my dealer friends out there can agree with me on this. Normally it falls apart after 30 days, 60 days, whatever it may be, because we're doing it the wrong way. Approaching people blindly in the service drive can generate you some deals. And if you get a really, really dialed in process, it can sustain, but that's not our reality. In most cases, it's awkward. The amount of rejection that we see, customers don't want to talk to us, the service advisors get frustrated with us interrupting the flow, normally it doesn't sustain. What we want to do is we want to be choosy. If I reach out to everybody every single time they're in service, they start to tune it out and they go, well, this isn't special, this isn't unique, there's no demand for my specific car. So actually looking through your service schedule the day before, identifying the cars you actually need or the people who are actually in a proper position and doing smart individualized outreach to those customers the day before they come in and or being there ready to greet them after they check in for service, that is going to get you a significantly higher and more predictable penetration of acquisitions. The, the gross margin on vehicles that we acquire from the curb, from our customer bases proactively is typically two to $3,000 higher than a vehicle that we buy at auction. That's our acquisition strategy is it's diversified. <laughs> uh, the last part on it, last part on it is making sure that we're, we're getting every trade we possibly can, right? We're very, very focused on if, if somebody has a trade and they walk for whatever reason, we've got a follow-up process in place. We want to make sure that, hey, we're not giving them a number that they're unhappy with and we're not at least having that conversation as to why educating them and now they leave, Right. When they leave, we know where they're going. They're just beelining it somewhere else to see if they can get more money for their trade. But trade in value or trade in gross when we take in trades is actually right on par with curb acquisitions. Right. Cars that we're buying anywhere other than at auction. That's how we're making our money. How can we put a proper focus on acquiring those vehicles on a consistent basis is what we're working on every single day. Now, alongside that effort, you're still going to be met with customers being customers. And there are more customers researching. There are more customers that are putting themselves in the market because of the time or just trying to figure out what's going on. What are we doing about the longer lead to purchase times? Yeah. So we've actually, this has been um, last six months, a big focus for us. Um, as we look at the data, not only the data from us, but some of our partners like Urban Science, um, some of our manufacturers are really look, taking a deep look right now as to how long is it taking people to make a decision? From if they send a lead to your store, we can actually see now, hey, we've got 20% of our customers who sent a lead to our store, but they bought at our competitor, whether it's say make or competitive make right down the road. And oftentimes what we're seeing is that purchase was 45, 55, 65 days after the initial lead. And what's happening with this, and we should have probably been more anticipatory of this happening, is the cost, as we all know, and the affordability of vehicles has changed. Right. And people are really strapped right now in their budget. So they're looking much harder, much closer and longer at what are the options? What are the pricing? 
What are the rates? What are the payments going to be? We always kind of lived with the, uh, the impression that from a leap to seven days, man, seven to 10 days, that's about how long it's going to take a majority of people to make a decision. On new cars, that's changed. And those lead times are now starting, or those purchase times are starting to average 30, 45, 60 days, depending on the manufacturer. So we've implemented a few things. One is AI long-term follow-up. So when we look at the data, customers who buy engage after they send a lead within the first five days at 96% of the time. So a lead comes in, and they engage in back and forth conversation within the first five days. Of the cars we sell, 96% of the people who buy from us engage in that period of time. So I don't want my sales team necessarily for unengaged leads getting two or three tasks a day for 30, 60, 90 days. It's not a good use of their time. So long-term AI follow-up does that heavy lifting, to try to engage those clients who didn't engage. But from engagement, right? Lots of times they'll respond and say, hey, I was just curious, you know, what was your lease price on this one? Or what were your programs on this one? Or whatever it may be. What we're doing is now, instead of just having 30 days of follow-up, we've actually stretched that out to 60 and 90. And it's weekly touch points with a theme. Because normally what we find is salespeople don't know how to do long-term follow-up. All they know how to do is pick up the phone or send a text and say, hey, are you still in the market? Right? There's no value there. So we created themes, which is, hey, new inventory has arrived. Right? We've had price drops here. Hey, there's actually a new model coming out. And we just got a shipment of this. All right? We've just had a rate drop. So when, when your follow-up stretches beyond the first four or five days, you've got to mix it up if you want engagement. You've got to have a different theme, a different reason you're reaching out. Otherwise, what you'll find is that your sales team is being robotic or they're faking it. And everybody, all my dealer friends out there know what I mean, right? LVM, LVM. LVM. Yep. Yep. So long and short of it is that buying timeframes from lead to purchase on new cars are changing. They're getting longer. And it's really because people are looking for somebody or a store to solidify their belief. And, and that's the way I try to train salespeople. When you receive a lead, your primary job is to make the customer think they were right. And it's a weird concept for people, but that's really your job, right? Charles, you can answer me this. Do you ever submit a lead, fill out a form online, unless you're ready to do business? Or at least Not think about until it. until I am ready to get in the car and go to that place, or, ha or I'm ready to spend my money. I'm ready to give up Correct. my money. I've already sat down with it. I just need the vehicle to do that, which is typically whoever I'm trying to give my patronage to. Like, because you, you know what's going to happen. In that mode. The, the moment you put your name, phone number, and email address in a lead form, and I don't care if this is for getting a massage, I don't care if this is for buying a house, getting a loan, whatever it might be, the moment you do that, you know what's about to happen. You're a well, slug it, you are opening that door, but it is worth it because you have already made the decision on that. Ready to go. Yep. So uh, as, as we think about it, like, all right, somebody submitted a lead. They took the time to put all this information in. My job, they think they want to buy this or they wouldn't do it. They think that your store, or at least maybe it's a true car lead or a, you know, a, kind of a broker type lead, but they think like I'm ready to do business with this entity. So when I'm analyzing the lead and I'm following up, my mindset is all I really have to do is make Charles think he was right. <laughs> and how do I do that? I build confidence in the process, confidence in the product, present myself as very helpful. I read the lead so I actually know what you asked, right? Silly as that is, that's a problem in our story. We all read the lead and customers like, hey, what's your lease payment? And we just send them, hey, the price is 26 dollars It's not answering their question. And they might I'm be out. out. They might be out. They might be out. Right? Hey, you can, and, and sometimes you only get one chance, right? Like, hey, I want this person, this store, this entity to impress me and give me confidence that I am thinking the right way. And that's really the art right now of handling the leads and trying to reduce those time frames. And if we can't reduce them, at least staying close, staying front of mind, so that when 45 days, 60 days hits, and now they do see the deal they want, I'm actually still playing in the game. Yeah. So along with that time frame, right, we do have to stretch that out and not follow up for follow up's sake, but having a, a method to our madness what do we do about the other messaging that might be going on at the same time as our follow-up? Or now, Jake, I know this isn't your stores, but as an industry, there are times where there are multiple messages coming from multiple different places that are technically from the same dealership. What is that doing to our customer 
Like, what does that look like to a customer? But also, what does that do to our staff when they're trying to get back into the deal? I think this is probably one of the biggest uh, opportunities within our industry for improvement. Um, because of the way the vendor structure and the dealership's desires <laughs> are all set up, is we're always looking for the next latest and greatest thing, right? That's why there's you know uh, digital dealers going on right now, right? There's thousands of vendors there, right? Dealers are there looking for the next silver bullet, and <clears throat> integration between our partners that communicate with our clients is limited. We all know that, right? There's a lot of you know open APIs and things out there, but really trying to get everything integrated. So I know as a dealer, and this is for my owners out here to really think about, do I know every message that's going out to my client base? Do I know what where it's being sent from, what the message is, and the cadence in which it's happening? Not too many dealers can answer that question. Right. Somebody in the store probably knows it, but it's usually not just one person. It might be actually two or three different departments that are somewhat segmented and siloed. So I've got communications going out through X time or true video for service customers. Right. I've got email blasts going out through auto alert. I've got AI communications happening through Conversico or through my CRM. I've got companies like Full Path and, um, you know, those who are sending different communications out. And there's not really a great ecosystem right now that puts that all together so I can truly understand. So to your question, for our customers, it confuses them, right? Sometimes some of these systems are set up to, looks like you can reply, but there's nobody on the end or, and other end of the reply. <laughs> so they're getting a message from the store. They click some sort of, hey, I'd be interested in this. And it sits, nobody's looking at it, right? It's scary that that happens, but it does happen. I'm sure most of you out there have experienced this. For our staff, it can be demoralizing. Right. We're saying things, calling up. Hey, I've got this great new offer of, you know, 0.9 percent. Hey, I just got a communication that said it's 2.9 percent. Right. A different system or setup. Um, not knowing, especially when it's your client base or your leads, not knowing what is going out to them, what kind of communication is ha happening, makes it very hard to give the proper experience to the customer once they're engaging. with you. It can cause all sorts of things to go haywire and ultimately do the opposite of what we're trying to do, which is deliver a world-class customer experience. And, and I think that's something that dealers need to do a better job of getting the public to understand what we're trying to do. Because people still, in, in I think, in uh, the, the masses think dealerships don't care. We do. I think this is actually one of the most customer-friendly industries out there. We will go to the ends of the earth if we make a mistake or a customer is unhappy and do things that ultimately we probably don't even need to because we're afraid of a bad experience, a bad review. Right. We don't want that getting out into the world, but we because of all of our different broken communication systems, we don't always do a great job of letting the public know, like dealerships aren't there to rip you off. Right. <laughs> I mean, there's exceptions. Don't get me wrong. We're here to earn clients for life, to deliver a great experience. And ultimately, one of the things we're trying to do right now at Walzer is to speed up that experience. And that's where a lot of times these broken communication systems, they're not just for advertising. It's actually within the store as well. When I'm trying to complete a deal, I got to have this push to here and this push to here. And everything's got to line up penny to penny as I'm doing my desking and moving that into, you know, getting a loan and getting all those paperwork, you know, the paperwork processed and funded. Um, but how do we speed it up? It takes too long to buy a car. And that's one of the things we're hyper focused on right now. So from somebody saying yes to when they leave, can I make that under an hour? <laughs> and and that's Please. what we're shooting for. Please. Please, right? <laughs> and you know, and, we, and we everyone has tools to do it. We, we, do. we have the workings of the tools to do it. And it does make sense because people make bigger purchases that still get that time down. And nobody's and better at selling cars than our industry. We, we sell the thing that keeps our world mobile. You would think that would be. You would think we could speed it up. Yeah. <laughs> now, some of it has to do, honestly, some of it has to do with government red tape, right? There's so many things that we've got to do correct. A lot of it has to do with funding, right? If I don't have the funding, the rebates, right? All these things, a lot of the time is dealerships doing the CYA, right? We're covering our butts, making sure we're not going to get hit with litigation or chargebacks or things like that. But without question, there is a way to get the transaction time, at least for a standard deal, right? If it's a get me done or, you know, a, a challenge credit situation, or there's, you know, weird intricacies within the deal that can take. They know. Yeah. yeah. Normally customer customer knows what's going on. 
But if I'm an 800 credit score and I'm leasing my fourth car from you and I say, yes, let's go with this one, I shouldn't be at the dealership four hours later. I shouldn't. <laughs> I should be in and out of there in 60 minutes. And that's what's going to make them remember. It. Go, wow, that was faster and easier and more effortless than last time. And that's what we want to really try as hard as we can as, as an industry. And this is where vendors need to play a role as well, right? To, to develop and deliver these tools that help dealerships do that for customers. If you can deliver a car in under an hour, you're going to win more times than not, especially if you can start to advertise it. Because yes. that's what customers want. Yeah. It's too scary to advertise it right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, buy a car in under an hour while well, they're sitting there for four hours. Like you just blew everything that you've tried to build reputation wise. Um, but it, it is, to your point, it's possible and we need to do better. So, by your summation, what would need to happen or what type of tool? would you look for if we were in a perfect world? So at Walzer, we are actually developing. Um, we, we've been developing it for 15 years. We have a proprietary software that we are um, part owners of investors in called Fuse. Um, Fuse is a digital retailing tool that's not just for online, but it's actually in store. And we use it for every single car deal. So it instantly desks everything down to the penny. It allows us to push the deal to um, paperless signing, and really allows everybody in the dealership to cashier a car deal. And that's what that's the problem at most dealerships. Now, at Walzer, we're different because we don't have finance managers. We are a single point of contact. So it goes from start to finish with your salesperson. And we have empowered them through Fuse to actually be able to transact a car deal without a manager. And that is helping to speed up the process. We still have managers who are looking at them, making sure everything is right. We've got all sorts of different roles to help with billing titling and all that sort of stuff, you know, to make sure things go down properly. But when you say yes to me at most dealerships, if I'm the salesperson, I'm going to fill everything out, put that in the finance manager's like wall folder, usually second, third, fourth, fifth in line, depending on how busy the store is, right? On that particular day, then they have to take everything, get it processed. Now you're sitting on a couch for two and a half hours. Salesperson keeps coming back to you and saying, it's just going to be five to more minutes, like 45 times. Until you finally get to the office, sign up for a half an hour, and then you leave. Oh, that, that process has got to change. It's got to change if we really want to deliver what clients want, which is, hey, I want to buy a car. I want it to be transparent. I want it to be easy. And I want it to be fast. And it's very hard to do that when you have that bottleneck of, well, there's only two or three offices in the dealership in which you can actually transact a deal. A deal. So um, technology, there's others out there, but we have been developing and utilized Fuse, and it's, it's really helping us achieve our goal. Now, how do you tie that? We talked talk about all these different systems. That's going to handle the deal portion. Are we we're pulling that in via API to a CRM or what's the plan? So all, all of that is uh, open API to our CRM. So once a deal and to the DMS. So once a deal gets booked, all that does parse into the CRM. Um, but we actually do utilize at Walls or we utilize a CDP. Uh, that's a, a buzzword that's going around a lot right now. Um, it exists because of the lack of integration uh, between multiple different you know, vendors, partners, softwares. So a CDP is allowing us to put as many, and it's not 100% complete yet, but it's like every interaction that happens within a client's pro profile is getting pushed into one spot. So we still use a CRM, we still use auto alert, but we can look at this and at least see, all right, we've got, you know, um, blast emails going out here. Now they're clicking it here on our website. I can see they're looking at these VDPs back in July. Now they submitted a lead here in September, like all of that information being blended into one spot. So I can truly see like what is happening with this client. Awesome. Now, ideally, ideally, we're going to have a CRM or a, a platform that allows us to do all of this in one spot and not have to utilize so many different sources and vendors. Like that would be the utopia that, I mean, all my dealers out there know we've talked about this. I wouldn't this be great. So, um, you know, two years, five years down the road, whenever, hopefully that product becomes available. And that's something that dealerships can really look at and go, Hey, I'm not only am I giving my clients a better experience and my staff a better experience, but maybe I can cut some costs well and not have to be signed up for so many things. A hundred percent agree. And we're on the hunt, right? And if you like more cool. about a tool that's built in that way from a foundation that Jake knows better than anybody else, you come check us out and look at our CXM. That is what we've heard loud and clear from dealers like Jake and people who are looking for, how do I bring it all together, right? 
because that's that's the number one question. And there's a new vendor that pops up every 15 minutes. <laughs> so how do we pull the systems together to not only keep our customers happy, but keep our inside of the dealership organized? So, and keep our employees happy. I mean, it, it, yeah. we, we talked about turnover earlier. One of the, the things that causes turnover is selling cars isn't easy anymore. Like mm -mm. there's so many logins you have to have. You have to be an expert in so many different things. And if we can shrink some of that down, I think it's going to make the job easier and it's going to make people more efficient. And if I'm more efficient, I'm selling more cars in the same amount of time. I'm making more money, right? Anybody who's, there's some people who just try selling cars who don't like it, right? They're, we're going to lose them. Like it's not for them. It happens. But people who enjoy it and have the skill set to potentially be good, but it's just too complex, takes them too long to get, you know, their bearings. Like that's who we lose. That's why if we lose them in the first you know, month, sometimes in the first day we lose people. Like everybody out there is <laughs> it's like, by lunchtime, they're out like this isn't for me. Um, but if we get people successful within that first three to six months, they're employees for a long time, potentially for life, right? Like, and that's what we want. And by making the job more effortless, I want it to be effortless to buy a car, but I also want it to be effortless to sell a car. And I actually, we focus more on the, how you know effortless is it to buy a car, but at the same time, we're really focusing on how can I make this easier for the staff to get a car down the road so that they can move on to the next and still give a world-class experience to that customer. The four-hour car deal is killing people out there. It really is, right? Hey, it's Saturday. I take it up at nine. We got to look at a few cars. They agree to buy. I'm not done with that client until three in the afternoon, and we're all tired. <laughs> but Everybody's that's like white. <laughs> white, right? Get down the road by 10. I'm on to the next. I'm feeling good about myself. That's how I build a culture of retention, right? Because everybody's productive. Everybody's having fun. Everybody's enjoying what they do. That's not always the case right now. I think we're on the right track. I think we're going to get there. Jake, thank you for spending some time with me, answering a few questions. Always, in always this about to rush. <laughs> but um, I'm sure we're going to have some more conversations. There's some new things on the horizon coming in 2025. We'll take we'll, we'll we'll take another gander and maybe I'll have you back on here soon. But again, thank you for coming on this episode of the feed, and I will talk to you on the next one. Thanks, Charles. Bye, everybody.